Thank you for having us. Uh, my name is Steve Smith, and this is Hannah, and we're here to share with you about a project we did this past fall um, that we think might be a model or an inspiration for work you might be able to do in your local communities that could promote um, resilience through education. Um, like many people in this room, uh, we had the great opportunity to uh, work with Steve. He joined us this past fall um, and somehow managed to condense the history of water quality issues and mining, um, mine reclamation in the Silverton area into a half an hour presentation that our students were still smiling at the end at. Um, and I think that's a great feat. Um, this project was not just Hannah and myself. Um, we worked at Animus High School, which is a charter school in Durango, Colorado. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, Jeremy May in the back, Jeremy, um, was there helping us with, um, he works with Mountain Studies Institute at the time, he was at AmeriCorps Vista. And then some of the um, inspiration and funding for this project came through a EPA funded grant that Dan Collins uh, was the PI on. We'll talk a bit more about that in a second. Um, and then of course the stars of the show were actually our students. Um, the 65 students who got to learn about water quality in a very um, engaging and hands-on way. So how does education promote resilience? Or asked another way, why would we be up here today? Um, and we're up here today because we think that young people need to know in order to care. Um, the issues that we're dealing with are generational. Um, they, people before us, people are going to come after us, and eventually there will be new people sitting in this room addressing these same challenges. Um, we think that we need a citizenry that is scientifically and mathematically literate to address the challenges, the sophisticated challenges that we all face. Um, we think that attitudes of stewardship are cultivated, that if we want students to do more than care, to know how they can work to impact change, we have to give them opportunities and show them ways they can. And finally, we think that um, everyone in this audience, um, ourselves included, our partners, benefit um, from the positive publicity that comes along with working with education. Um, so to that end, Animus High School. Um, we are a charter school in Durango, Colorado. We serve about 250 students. And we're a project-based charter school. And what that means is that our students access curriculum through doing projects. And those projects um, start by learning like the normal content you might in a classroom. Uh, so I teach chemistry. So we learned a lot of chemistry associated with water quality. But then that goes into them doing something with that knowledge and going deeper um, and connecting with professionals and trying to do real work. Um, this project was also made possible by Mountain Studies Institute, who provided a lot of connections, um, helped provide expertise in the field, and have done a lot of things to educate um, students at our school as well as throughout the greater San Juan uh, region. Um, as I mentioned, this project was also made possible by SCAPE, which was an EPA-funded uh, project that was um, throughout the entire Colorado River Basin. Uh, schools, about 20 of us were connected um, through a data sharing network. We had the uh, capacity to access um, and purchase water quality monitoring equipment. And then uh, we shared that data with each other as well as looking at the place-based questions of why are the water quality issues in uh, Pinedale, Wyoming different than Yuma, Arizona? And what does that look like? And mm -hmm. some communities are dealing with mining related issues. Others, it's things entirely different. Um, that program was hosted in part by the Telluride Institute and by Arizona State University. Um, so we put these groups together. We bring the students, we bring the teacher design curriculum. Mount Studies Institute makes the connections with the local groups and then the uh, federal government through SCAPE hosted by these organizations pays for the equipment that we need to get students out in the field and do this cool work that Hannah's going to talk more about. Hi. I'm Hannah. Uh, it's really nice to be here. Thank you for coming today. So before we dive into full project, I just want to give you all just a really brief background on Animus. Oops, it is, I'm sorry. Um, a really brief background on Animus High School. So one of the things that we do is something called grade level math, and what that means is we integrate students of all mathematical abilities into our classrooms instead of separating them by ability. And we do this for a couple of reasons. The first is to have a wider range of diversity when it comes to problem solving. And the second is to have the opportunity to teach really powerful cross-curricular projects throughout our grade levels. So Steve teaches 11th grade chemistry, and I teach 11th grade math. And we thought that this was a really excellent opportunity to show our students how math and science are intertwined in a real-world scenario. So Steve approached me in August and was wondering if I was interested in teaching a project that was focused around water quality, and I said that I was. 
So we sat down and we had to hash out some logistics. Things like what content did we want to teach? How much plus time did we want to dedicate to the project? What did we want our field trip to look like? And what the final project would be? So we decided that we would take our students for a day trip up to Silverton. We decided to dedicate two and a half, week, uh, two and a half weeks of class time um, to this project and for content and to have our students produce a final report. And the final report was essentially Steve's expectations on his lab write-ups and my expectations on our problems of the week, and we married the two together. And so when we initially announced this to students, it sounded like the worst nightmare, but they were pleasantly <laughs> surprised as they went through the project and they learned a lot, and this was really evident in their reflections and their important sections and in their self-assessments. So, we announced to our students that we were taking them to a uh, to Silverton for a field trip, and naturally their stoke levels escalated rather quickly. Gave, uh, gave them a chance to be off campus, be in Silverton during the fall, and to not be working on one of Steve's lab write-ups or one of my paths, but they, they didn't know that at the time that we were going to do that in terms of weeks, so we worked on them. So, <laughs> Steve, myself, and a bunch of parent volunteers uh, shoved up our students up to Silverton, where we broke them up into three rotating groups throughout the day. First, our students performed a stewardship activity just removing invasive species around the river corridor. The second group did, uh, took water quality measurements in the three tributaries that flowed into the Animus River. And the third group took, took a trip up to Gladstone to listen to Steve Fearn discuss the history and legacy in the Bonita Peaks Mining District. So here's a fun little picture of our students removing some invasive species pulling some leaves, pulling some thistles, some toad flax, and some oxidaisy. This picture up here, this is one of our, uh, one of our foreign exchange students measuring the stream flow of one of the tributaries flowing into the Animus River. And we have another group of students writing down their observations and their data that they collected from the tributaries. And finally, here are some of our students listening to Steve Barron up in Gladstone discussing the implications of mining in the Bonita Peaks Mining District and the Great Sea Mines Bill. As soon as we returned to Durango, I just noticed that my students were incredibly complimentary of Steve Fairn for providing a perspective that is both honest and realistic. So, big shout out to Steve for making such an impact on our students. Sorry. So, we returned to Durango, and in my math class, we decided to study statistics, and the way that I taught statistics was through on dice rolling games, and we learned concepts such as mean, median, mode, standard deviation, and then I taught them how to calculate that and relate that, those methods back to the data that they collected when they were up in Silverton. The second concept I taught was something called weighted averages, which I taught through the ones of grades, which led to a rather heated discussion on whether letter grades are a valid way to measure student success. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so if you're still with us, we've taken a filter up at the Silver Tent, we got the students excited, we've given them a chance to do something of value. Um, then we made sure that we taught the content we're asked to teach. Um, and now we're going to take it to the next level, and we're going to try to get them to emulate professional work. And the way we did that is we had data from the Animus River, from Cement Creek, and Mineral Creek, and we asked them to predict what's going to happen when they converge um, and form the Animus. And then um, can they prove that? Uh, and then we would compare it to the USGS data. Uh, so, they take their data, they compile it into a shared spreadsheet, they start filtering through it for internal um, reliability, comparing it to historical uh, USGS data. Then they use some spreadsheet functionalities, they were absolutely, after Hannah taught them how to do standard deviation by hand, to show them that it could be done in about 30 seconds with pivot tables, blew their mind, they were stoked. And then uh, we said, alright, now put that together and make a prediction. Um, and they com uh, some of the students just averaged everything. Some realized they had to use weighted averages. A couple of our really talented students realized that pH is logarithmic and you have to mess with it before you can put it into a weighted average. And they take all that together and they get this prediction. Oh, we're back, we're back. Boom. They make the prediction. This is what's going to be in the Animus River. We go to the USGS data and we see that the station wasn't working that day. <laughs> <laughs> and that was great. Um, because then they, they recognize that in the real world, sometimes there's not a right answer. There's not a back of the book you can turn to. Instead, they had to stand on their own uh, justifications. Um, so that was fantastic. Uh, and they learned a lot in this process. And Hannah's going to talk a little bit more about that. 
So one of the things that we do at Animus is we ask our students to be reflective on everything. So we ask them to be reflective on projects, we ask them to be reflective on exhibitions, on teachers, reflect on being reflective, literally everything. So there were many high points from this field trip and the two and a half weeks that Steve and I taught this project, but these three bullet points up here really stood out to us. The first was students really had the opportunity to see how math and science were used in a real world context, both paired and independently. Students also had the opportunity to talk to the EPA and ask them difficult questions and unanswered questions about the Gold King Mine Spell of 2015. And the biggest one, I believe, was students developed really strong collaboration skills with writing the reports. As soon as we returned to Durango, I paired them off randomly, and I expected them to work efficiently with each other for two and a half weeks. So they learned how to collaborate with their differences with time management, writing style, and understanding content. So, these next couple of slides are direct quotes from our students' reports, just kind of showing the significance and the effect that this project had on them. It was interesting when we went up and talked to the guy, and the guy he was referred to Steve Barron, near the Gold King Mine, and I was able to better understand what happened during the spill a few years ago from Carter. As a member of the Animus River Basin community, we must partner with organizations and stakeholders to ensure clean water for future generations. That was from Amaya. All right, so we do two other things with this that really uh, makes project-based learning different than um, book learning. We didn't stop with this report. Um, the students kept investigating water quality throughout the rest of the year. Um, and in chemistry class, I brought in speakers from Trout Unlimited, San Juan Basin Health, the City of Durango, Mountain Studies again. Um, and all these different um, experts got to interact with the students and give them perspectives on water quality issues relating to mining, as well as other uh, water quality issues. Um, and this culminated in an event where the students got to create something. Um, we were fortunate in Durango that right now our wastewater reclamation facility is being remodeled. Part of the vision for that is an educational space in the future. And so my students designed um, conceptual designs or prototypes of potential ex um, educational exhibits that could go there. So here you see a student teaching um, her mother how to fish in this game that they created for elementary school age students where um, by depending on what type of fish you pull out of the river, you get to learn something about the metals that might be present in that river. Um, and as you can see, again, this is great plus publicity for all the groups involved. Um, so to recap, our students got excited. They got their hands dirty, literally. Um, they got to interact with a variety of professionals. They learned the math and science they had to anyway. They got to develop critical thinking skills and collaboration skills deeper than you might with traditional book work. They mimic professional work. And finally, many diverse groups were connected, collaborated, and either secured grant funding or validated the grant funding they had already received. And that was a great benefit to all organizations. So as we think about the takeaways and uh, thinking about resilience, we think that it's connected to diversity and interconnectedness. I mean, we're here from all over the San Juans right now. And we think that this also needs to stretch to generational um, interconnectedness. And if we want the next generation to understand, care about, and have the capacity to think critically about these issues of water quality, mines, and mine reclamation, we need to connect with them. And so that leaves us with an ask or an opportunity for you all. So content in schools that we teach can all be directly tied back to the San Juans and to the Southwest. Math, science, humanities, you name it, can all be tied back to the San Juans. So reach out to schools and reach out to teachers. Teachers are always looking for ways to innovate their classrooms and to keep student engagement high. Um, uh, small town media is really great at covering local events as well. And we think that, you know, uh, as you saw, the students picked a lot of weeds that day. And I know that a lot of the issues around mining um, remediation are challenging or above or beyond what uh, young people can do for a variety of reasons, but there's a lot that they can do. Um, also, this idea of integrating people um, makes you more competitive for grants. Um, and whether that is being a guest speaker, hosting a field trip, um, hosting interns, there's a lot of things that organizations can do to help build this resilience in our communities through education. Thank you. I want to be in their science class. Uh, that was really great. Thanks for making it so innovative and getting them outdoors. It's a wonderful thing to do for them, especially in their own communities where they get to experience some of the issues in their own backyard, get connected to that. And uh, for me, I think one of the nice things is getting them to think about Science is an active process in the outdoors, and it's not just something that happens in labs, and it's not just all data that doesn't come, where does the data come from, or here's how you collect it. So that was really great. Um, one of the other things that popped up for me is last night we had Jeb come in from Canejos, um, 
and his talk was about getting kids back outside, um, reconnected to just outdoors in general through activities and recreation. He works with the Boys and Girls Club out there. And it seems like that any of those things to me resonate really heavily, like getting kids away from a smartphone and any sort of device that has a blue screen and putting them back uh, on in dirt and getting them dirty. So uh, kudos to you for that. Um, questions from you all in the back. Yes, um, I'm curious as to uh, how uh, much use you uh, made of the data in your databases to do in the previous speaker and your third reference to the Okay, so the question was about using data from the Colorado Data Sharing Network prior to the work with the youth, okay? So in this year's work, we did not. Um, in previous years, so in the year of the Gold King Mine Spill, um, we made that the focus for chemistry for that year, and we were using the data that was being generated by MSI and the EPA and a variety of other groups in the classroom so that the students were manipulating real data sets. Um, and we are involved with the River Watch program throughout the state, and so we are adding data to that on the on Lightner Creek, which is, uh, runs right by our campus. But for this particular project, we did not pull that data. 